Hello. Ooh. Good evening. How are you guys? Woo! Woo! Um, in case you can't see, I have like little awesome cats on my dress. Pretty cute. Um, the reason I'm dressed up is I'm, I'm going to the Pie Ladies auction right after this, which I should see every single one of you there. All right, so um, to be on time, we're going to jump right in with um, Minal Pant, um, automatic documentation in multiple formats. OK, so um, I'll talk about a common problem we all face. Uh, we all develop our code, but documentation is the last thing on our minds. So I attended a talk yesterday, lightning talk, and the documentation page was blank, uh, which is the state for most of us um, who write code. Um, so when one of my projects is um, it's a UI application that we build. It's a desktop client. Uh, we have to provide a lot of training material and end user documentation. And it, it, is, um, it is always the last on our list. We are just trying to busy finishing our releases. So the current workflow we have uh, is, well, the document is written in Microsoft Word. It is outdated with every release. We have to play catch up all the time. Uh, the screenshots are collected manually. There's room for error. And, we and the, there's a request to support multiple formats. So we are, we are supposed to provide PDFs and web help. And we are always trying to play catch up and always trying to do double work. So I want to show you what we did with uh, trying to automate our document, uh, documentation. Um, so, we, so the whole goal was to keep the document with the code. The way we do coding, let's start documenting our code, as, uh, documenting the documentation as well. So we kept it simple, use a single source, which, um, and the format we picked was Markdown. We version control it, um, we do diffs and tests. We review and uh, have it edited by the technical writers automate the screenshots, and create a build environment for our documentation. So the tools that we use are Python, Markdown, Pandoc, and Docbook. And I'll show you a little demo of how we achieve that. Um, so here is, so here is uh, if you can see that, here is what we have. So basically, all of, the, all of our documentation is in a Markdown file. It's a very long fi file, and it has placeholders for images. And then there is a make file that actually does all of the translation. And um, then we wrote a script called um, screenshot.py. So since my application is Python and, and Qt and PyQt based, uh, we created a script that runs, um, opens up every window, grabs that window, and captures a screenshot on the fly. So each time we do a build, we run the script, and we get a whole new set of images, which is current with, with our code. And now I will just show you what, how we build it. So I just say make clean, make, and come on. Taking a while. All right, and it starts building. Uh, it starts building the documentation right now. So, and the resulting files are here. So, with this one markdown file, I have now created a PDF file, complete with images and complete with content. And this shows all of the screenshots, which are the most recent one that came with the code. And we also happen to create the, uh, the web help, which has all the contents here, has all the screenshots. And this is what, and then it has a cool search feature where I go and search for the bag, then it gives me the hits and all the pages where this uh, keyword appears. And this uh, web help, we actually go and ship it with our product to the end user. So, so, so this is a way to, to go ahead and automate your documentation and not fall behind uh, and leave it to the technical writers. That's all I had. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, next up. Larry Hastings. Um, I learned actually a new word today, a, a, ch a stew. <laughs> the extraneous else. OK. So um, how many people here were in David Beasley's talk yesterday? 
Uh, this was David's first slide, so to speak. He actually did a live demo, and he typed this in live on the screen. And I saw that code, and I was like, oh, because there's a thing that I hate in, uh, when people write code. There's a particular construction that I dislike. Consider this if statement. If you enter this if statement, you will never leave, or rather, you will never leave in the context of this function because you return uh, unambiguously out of the function. You don't need this else. You will never reach the code underneath the else unless you have already skipped over that if statement. My rule, eschew the extraneous else. If you have an if that ends in a return, you don't need an else. So let's take David's code, boom. Every time I do this, this uh, transformation, I like the code better. It works, thank you. This is also true of while statements or, or other looping constructs. If you have continues or breaks, you don't need this elif, you don't need the else. Boom, I like this better. The final imaginary bad example, if you have an if statement that does continue, but the else statement uh, returns, swap them, and now, boom, you can get rid of the else statement. That's it. Go forth and clean up your code. Oh, awesome. That was like super quick. <laughs> lightning, lightning talk. Thank you so much. That's right. Well, a lot, a lot of people want more than five, it seems like. Um, all right, Jackie, are you, uh, are you almost set up? Yeah. Yeah, all right. Is, is this on? Um, you can talk into that. So, <laughs> um, so up next is Jackie Kazil. What, what, which talk did I choose? Identities, um, pri privacy, and uh, user trust. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so just quick disclaimer, um, uh, in my professional capacity, I work for the U.S. government. Uh, I'm not representing the U.S. government today. I'm representing myself in my personal capacity. <laughs> Moving on. Um, so I started working on this project, and uh, you can go on GitHub and find this. Um, and so I learned a lot about identity and trust. Um, it's entirely possible that I hack up something that I say today, because I'm not an expert. Um, and I'm having a little imposter syndrome right now. So this is my mom. Uh, she's from East Europe. Uh, both my parents are. And so I grew up with a very uh, distinct mistrust of like everything. Um, and so she would say something along the line. When I told her I was working on this project, she was like, what are you doing with my information? <laughs> and so you know, when you build a system, you really want to think about putting your user first and who is your user and understanding that user. That doesn't mean turning around to your coworker and asking them, does this make sense? So let's build a system together really quickly. So show of hands, uh, how many between email and third party authentication, how many of you would choose email for authenticating? You, so you enter a new email address, okay. Third party authentication, Google, Twitter, Facebook, okay. Um, so systems that have, uh, for trust in your user, systems, especially startups, um, sometimes use third-party authentication as a default because it's easy, because they don't have to build anything. And you lose, you can lose like half your population with that. Uh, use, how many use are there? So me's, there are professional me, there's work me, I mean, there's work me, there's personal me, there's pie ladies me, um, there's me who does stuff for my mom, there's many me's to the world. Um, so think about how many use there are. How many, how many different Google accounts or, G, or email accounts do you have? And with people who might want to interact with your system, how many different accounts might they be using? So thinking about those, thinking accounts as profiled, uh, then you have identity. So you have many profiles, many use, and you have one identity. Identity is your legal identity. And so basically, with respect to profiles, that's called level of assurance one. That's the official term. And that is a level of confidence that the person who created the account is the same person who re returns another time over and over again. But you don't necessarily have the same, you don't have any illegal attachment to that person. As where identity gets into attribute verification from some sort of official um, source. So, for the second part of this, let's do a quick raise of hands. Who, how many of you would want your identity verified by a bank? Okay, government. Okay, or other private identity entity that is not a bank or government. 
See? So this would be like something along the lines of, um, let's say, uh, mortgage or mortgage applications. Um, this could be your taxes. This could be a variety of things, um, which involves passing attributes such as your social security number, um, your address, and on a higher level would include uh, doing verification from your credit report, which is called LOA 2 and 3. Remember LOA, I, I, uh, in my professional capacity, which I'm not here today as, um, uh, we love our acronyms. Um, so just, just to remind you, LOA is level of assurance, 2 and 3, 2 being some confidence, 3 being high confidence. These are all just attribute verifications though. And if you think about this, I could be my husband because I know all of his information. Um, so I could be my husband at LOA 3. What I can't be my husband as is LOA 4, which is the step up where you actually have to go somewhere. So I'm going to propose something to you today. What if we lived in a world where we had some sort of identity verification where we had to go in person and we had a, a bunch of places that existed uh, where we could do that, and that was the U.S. Postal Service, possibly. So think about how users are going to use your site and how they might interact with your materials and sort of what do you need to give them at what time to be able to make sure they trust the experience. Other things to consider are um, uh, passwords. We have too many of them. We don't need another one. Um, so sometimes relying off of another like email or two-factor off can be a good, an easy way to get around a password without having to create another one. The frequency at which somebody interacts with your site. And uh, that's it. And here are some resources, and I'll tweet these out later. Thank you. Awesome. This reminds me that um, the Pi Ladies is having a GPG key signing party tomorrow at an open space sometime in the afternoon. I don't know where, um, but I will tweet it from the Pi Ladies uh, Twitter handle. Um, all right, so next up we have uh, Greg Ward um, talking um, that one weird thing about English. All right, those of you, there are a couple people in this room who have worked with me in the past or who work with me currently. You already know what I am about to confess publicly. You already know that I am a grammar geek. Now the rest of you know my confession. Oh dear, the, the, the secret is out. So I'm here to share with you one of my pet grammatical peeves, something that makes my eyes bleed when I see it. Before I get to it, I need a quick review because based on the man pages, readme files, doc strings and comments I read every day, there's a lot of programmers who don't realize that a sentence in English begins with a capital letter and ends with a period. In between the capital letter and the period, we almost always find a subject and a verb, and we often find an object. Here are two simple examples. Jane followed the dog. Good, basic, clean, simple English sentence. No problem there. It's just fine. You can get fancy. You can add things like subordinate clauses. Adjectives, adverbs, yada, yada, yada. Um, spot ran quickly after the stick is a, is a nice little elaboration that throws in an adverb to spice things up. I got really fancy on the next one. There's a subordinate clause in there, and there's something that I know that through the stick, at the dog, I don't know what at the dog is. I'm sure a real grammar, gr grammarian would know, but I just threw this talk together this afternoon, so sorry. Anyway, it's a nice sentence, it's fun, it sparkles, it jumps off the page at you because it uses some fancy stuff. Now, there's one thing about English that a lot of people don't know. Almost as many, like, even more people don't know this than don't know about periods and capital letters. There's a rule in English that you can't just jam two sentences together with a comma. Please keep that in mind when writing documentation because I'm afraid it's wrong. Um, at various points in time, the Wikipedia article on this sin has claimed that in Bulgarian and Ukrainian, it is not merely acceptable, it is encouraged to jam two sentences together with a comma. Uh, I don't know the rules for any other languages. I'm pretty sure it's wrong in French, which is the only other language I know have any familiarity with. So please don't do it. Um, so here is an example of how not to write English. You cannot take these two simple, straightforward sentences, Jane followed the dog, she saw her brother. No, please don't do that. It makes my eyes bleed. Um, there's a nice article on Wikipedia all about this sin. The name of the sin, by the way, is the comma splice. Good to know. Take my fancy elaborate example. If you take those two sentences together, it's so wrong it hurts. 
because there's already a, a clause surrounded by commas, there's lots of verbiage in there, and if you jam those two sentences together, just no, a million times no. Now the good news is, oh, by the way, I, I forgot to mention, if, so, so th this violates the grammar of the English language, and all of us have natural language parsers as software in our brain. The parser for English in my brain is very good because I grew up speaking English, it's, it's, my, it's my mother tongue, and I'm sure that's true for a lot of you, and for a lot of you, it's not true. You grew up speaking some other language, and you've picked up some English along the way. If the parser, the software in your brain does not, well, especially if it doesn't flag this as problematic, um, there's a bug in the software in your brain, and I'm here to provide the patch. Please download it and apply it today. So it's really easy to fix these incorrect sentences. Um, Jane followed the dog and saw her brother. Nice, I like it. The, the last one is, is really nice because it turns out even though you cannot jam two sentences together with a comma, it is perfectly legal to jam two sentences together with a semicolon. All you have to do is add one dot and you're good. Um, the fancier example, the one that made my really eyes bleed, is also easy to fix, although to do it reasonably nicely, I had to tweak the wording a little bit. And to be honest, this sentence is grammatically absolutely fine, but it's a little bit artless. It's a little, I don't know, a little too wordy, a little clunky. It needs a little more work, but I threw this talk together in half an hour, so give me a break. Um, now, I've told you, or actually I told you a simple version of the rule. The reason this is one weird thing about English is because the real rule is that you can't just jam sentences together with a comma unless you're famous. Julius Caesar can do it. I came, I saw, I ca he did it in Latin, yes, but there is, only, there is only one way to translate that famous sentence of Julius Caesar's into English. I came, I saw, I conquered. That is not merely a comma splice, that is a double comma splice, but Julius Caesar can get away with it because he's famous. The Bible can get away with it. That is a sentence of, of awesome power and terror. Um, if that doesn't fill you with the fear of God, nothing will. Um, and it is a comma splice. Even, I've, ne I've never read that sentence before today. Um, I just found it in the Wikipedia article on comma splices. I, I, a, it is a beautiful and terrible sentence. A terrible in the sense of awe-inspiring, God-fearing. Um, I've never read it before, and yet the parser in my brain accepts it. Um, th somehow the poetry of the sentence transcends the, the comma splice. Or maybe just the fact that it's in the Bible, which is an ancient and famous book, they can get away with it. Huh, weird, eh? Um, sorry? Yeah, okay. And the final words uh, are from a wonderful book by Lynn Thruss called Eats, Shoots, and Leaves. Um, if you have time to read this, go ahead. If you don't, just find the book. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up we have um, Scott Sanderson uh, speaking on um, interactively visualizing C profile output. Hello. Awesome. Hey, um, cool. So my name is Scott. Uh, I work for a company called Quantopia, and we have people basically doing financial simulations. And almost all of our back end is built on top of things like uh, pandas and NumPy and stuff that's doing pretty high performance uh, numerical computing. And so we spend a lot of time staring at C profile outputs trying to figure out why our code is slow. Um, and after spending enough time playing with the, the PSTAT sort of command line interface, uh, I decided uh, to channel Raymond Henninger and said there must be a better way. Um, so if you haven't used uh, pandas or NumPy or something like that, ba they're basically fancy 2D arrays that provide a lot of like cool uh, slicing syntax and ways to have more fancy labels than just uh, numbers. Uh, you can look at them, sort of think about them like 2D tables like this. Um, and so a very common operation that you might want to do on that is something like concatenating them. So I've got uh, two data frames here that's just DF1, DF2, and I want to take them and squish them into one data frame that's just sort of them added up on one uh, axis. And Pandas provides a great uh, function for that. It's called concat. You pass it a list of data frames. Uh, but now, if you do that a lot, and especially if you do that in nested loops with data frames that are already nicely structured, uh, it turns out that that's actually not the most efficient way that you can do it. 
Um, and so if, also, if you have a new C profile, the way that you use it is uh, you just do cprofile.run. It spits out this .stats file, and then you can use a tool called uh, pstats to actually sort of interactively use that in the terminal. Um, but so I wanted, what I wanted to be able to do is to have a little bit more of sort of an interactive layer on top of that. Uh, and so we built this tool called pstats viewer. And what it does is lets you construct this stats viewer object, and then it provides a couple different ways of viewing the data that come out of pstats or out of C profile. So if I execute this it, and construct a, piece, or a stats viewer object and then do uh, my slow stats viewer dot grid, and I get this interactive grid come up that's actually doing uh, JavaScript stuff. And so I can do things like sort by particular columns, and I can see that I'm calling is instance 102,000 times. Um, which is taking up a good chunk of my time. I'm also calling numpy.ravel, uh, and also is subclass a whole bunch in here. Um, but it's nice because I can very quickly sort by different things and get a sense of what might be the cause of my code being slow. Uh, I can also scroll up and down interactively here, and particularly slick as I can filter by this and sort of get a nice like interactive way of exploring this profiling data that I have. Um, this is actually just sort of a generic view that lets you explore data frames at all like this, but one particularly useful thing I found it for is uh, pstats data. Um, the other view that I have for this is uh, using IPython's widget system. So if I do dot chart here, it pulls up, uh, uses Seaborn and uh, Matplotlib to generate these nice bar charts, and I can do things like sort by different total times, different call counts, different cumulative time, uh, and also control how many function calls it lets me look at. Um, and these are all telling me things like how many calls there were, how much time I spent in different functions, and how much time I spent in functions or something underneath it. That's the difference between cumulative time and uh, total time. Um, so now I'm going to go, OK, I see, OK, I've, I called is instance 100,000 times. What could possibly be necessary for calling is instance that many times? And it turns out that pandas concat method is actually really, really fancy and really, really powerful. And it does, it allows you to pass it a lot of like weirdly structured arguments and it will kind of figure out what you mean uh, and align all of your data. Um, and that's really convenient and really useful, but the cost of that is that it has to do a lot more error checking, it has to do a lot more introspection of what you're doing. And so if you know you have nicely arran uh, arranged data, you can use the NumPy primitives like this to reach into the sort of internal arrays, restructure them exactly how you want, and then reconstruct your data frame. Um, and so the two sort of most common tasks that I have interacting with profiling data is, one, I just want to look at my code and see why it's slow, which is what we just did. The other one is, now that I've re-implemented some function, I want to see, did I actually make it better? Uh, how do I compare the two different runs that I did? And so the other sort of interesting feature this has is comparison functions. So I can say compare grid, and it'll basically do sort of a SQL style join with those. And now I can say, OK, well, I used to be spending a whole bunch of time here. It's gotten about seven times faster. How about that is instance call that I was looking at? I've gone from 102,000 calls to his, to his instance to uh, 11,000. So I've cut that by roughly an order of magnitude. Uh, I'm now only calling anything 25,000 times. Um, so there's a really nice way for me to get a quick sense of what I actually improved here. Um, I can do the same thing with the chart view and get sort of side-by-side -side views and get a nice visual sense of how much time I was spending in my different functions. Um, so very briefly how this works is, uh, C profile output was loaded into a data frame. The chart view is powered by IPython and its widgets. The table view is uh, also powered by IPython's JavaScript views, and then a JavaScript library called SlickGrid. Uh, and you can find all the code here on Quantopian slash QGrid and uh, MLeben slash SlickGrid and IPython. Thank you. So in a, in a previous life, um, I was um, classically trained as a bassist. So I'm quite excited to hear um, uh, Jean-Francois um, speak on um, classifying pro versus mediocre um, viola players. Thank you. Hi, so um, that's a personal story. So my, uh, my partner is a viola player, and uh, I'm not, and I'm not a musician either. Um, so uh, when we listen to music, I often hear, uh, that's good, that's bad, very fast, and uh, I can tell. So I feel like there's this uh, world of beauty that I don't have access to. So I guess a sensible way to, uh, to listen to this, to, to, get, to fix this, I guess, this, uh, this lack of understanding would be to listen to music, but uh, maybe a computer can do it for me. <laughs> so um, I use this uh, very nice... Uh, 
uh, library called Essentia. It's a C++ uh, open source library, and uh, it has a Python binding. If uh, anybody used it, uh, please uh, try to uh, talk to me when uh, we meet in the in the hall somewhere because I don't have many questions about it. I'm just a newcomer in this. I'll use the very basic uh, functionality in it. Um, so I'm going to look at uh, two kinds of data. So uh, my partner, uh, Marina, and me. So uh, you'll see uh, uh, J, F, R, A, J. So when you see this, you have to associate it with mediocrity, and Marina is uh, professionalism. And um, here's the signal that I would get. So um, this is the, the audio signal, so just the pressure, uh, the pressure in the air translated into some electronic signal. And then with the, in this case, it's a sampling of uh, 44,000 uh, hertz. So of course, uh, all this data is compressed, and you don't see everything. So, uh, um, but you still have this uh, global, uh, global view here. But uh, that's almost like a big data problem from, uh, from my perspective, or at least if you have uh, many more uh, strokes, but not, uh, not that much. Anyway, I have those two samples here. You already see some uh, signs of mediocrity on the uh, lower side, but what I want to know is what's inside the stroke. So um, first I want to isolate the stroke signal, and uh, for this I combine the two signals uh, into just one array to do it just once. Then Essentia has this tool that um, tells you the onset, so whenever the, the sign changes. It's not working perfectly, but it's sensible because you know, the, si the, the signal is never completely smooth. So uh, there could be a way to correct it, but for, the, for this talk I just correct it by hand. I remove the ones that I don't like. Well, they don't fit like at the beginning of a stroke. So I have those strokes. Then they are isolated, so you can see them more clearly. But still, the, data, the information is too compressed. Um, so out of this now, uh, I, can, uh, I can try to analyze them and what's inside this using the feature. And that's, what, that's when the, uh, the, um, uh, the power of Essentia is coming in. So I use, uh, I use two. Uh, Two feature, so for now I use them blindly. You don't have to know uh, what they are. I can tell you their names, zero crossing rates, spectral centroids, but um, using them blindly, so I extract just two features. And let's see if I can see a difference from the two, uh, from the two uh, types of strokes. So here it is. So I separate them into uh, blue. Blue is mediocrity, me, and red is uh, the professional player. So uh, you can see a clear distinction uh, with, all, uh, with only those five strokes. So now let's go back to one of those features called zero crossing rate. So what is actually the zero crossing rate is when the pressure goes from positive or negative uh, with respect to some baseline. And uh, here, uh, to, to have a better idea of what it is, so I just took two strokes, uh, one good and one bad. And uh, well, you can see already that uh, one is crossing the zero line, so crossing the middle m more often. So where did this come from? It's um, actually it's uh, the creation of the overtone. So uh, prof professional players practice for for years just to have uh, their uh, their playing to resonate with the body of their uh, instrument and also well, let's say for the viola uh, and the uh, the bow also and everything in their environment. That's the, something that I couldn't pull off with my playing. And uh, you know that's that's um, you know that's a mix of what I do. I'm a physicist, and uh, my partner who's a player. And then um, there's the signal. So I, I guess I've, from this, I, I I feel like I have this glimpse of the beauty that I have. So uh, actually, I see even my my partner even more more beautiful just by looking at this. So I. I could, uh, I could talk more about this, but uh, time is uh, on the end, and uh, maybe I can close on this uh, sentimental note. So uh, here it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. I think now I would probably um, you know, fall into the mediocre area. Um, all right, so next up, we have um, Karen talking about quick design mm -hmm. wins. Um, hi, I'm Karen. Um, so I'm, it would be a bit ambitious to say that I'm going to teach you how to be a designer in five minutes, um, given that I've tried for hours or semesters and had variable success. But 
Uh, in the era of Twitter bootstrap, which gives even non-design-oriented people a lot of sensible defaults, um, there's still a lot of things left uncovered, and so I'm going to cover just a few of them in the five minutes I have here. Um, so the first is this concept of line height. Uh, the CSS line height property uh, is what determines the distance or spacing between the lines of text on a page. And uh, in the default styling, um, it's a multiplier, usually 1.2, um, and it, depend on, it depends a bit on the font, um, as some fonts are taller than others. Um, but it's a little tight, and it's not that pleasant to read. Um, it's actually a better default would be somewhere between 1.5 and 1.8. Um, and so uh, you'd have some CSS code that looks something like this, and you would suddenly have slightly fancier paragraph text. Um, Another thing to look out for is text width. Um, from before, w something that goes across the entire width of the page is generally not very readable, whereas uh, l columns that are less wide are much more digestible. Um, so you can accomplish that with something like this. You've got a fixed width on your encompassing container div, and the trick at the end is we'll, we'll automatically horizontally center your div in the middle of the page, so that's cool. Uh, contrast, so important design concept. Um, the default headers that you get with just your uh, client's built-in style sheet w in your browser don't actually differentiate that much between headers, so in H1, and H2, and H3, and so forth. Um, the default sizes are 32 pixels versus 24. Um, versus 16 for regular text, and you probably need that to be at least be doubled. Um, you get something like this, and then you much, okay, this is a bit exaggerated, but you have a much clearer hierarchy once you exaggerate that. And so something like this, you have a set font size, and the 4 and 2 EM syntax is saying whatever the base uh, font size is, I'm going to multiply it by 2 or 4. Uh, fonts. Uh, typefaces for the pedants in the room. Uh, so if you've just worked with Microsoft Word, you might think that, oh, you have plain text, you have bold, you have italic, sometimes you have bold italic, and those are your options in topography land. But no. Uh, welcome to the big leagues. Uh, a decent font a decent typeface that you would like to use for your website should have something along the lines of this level of selection of weights everywhere from numbers 100 to 900. Uh, some will even have 200, 500, 600, and 800, which aren't included here. Um, and italic variants of all of the above. And uh, this website has a subset of the font, free fonts available on Google Fonts that meet these criteria and have a sufficient number of choices in terms of topography. Or similarly, on Google Fonts, there's a sorting option number of styles that I would recommend you take a look at if you want a fully operational typeface. Um, yeah, so we can see that effect on our text as well. Uh, grids, so you know about Bootstrap, it's cool, but one pitfall I see people falling into is they build a brick wall, which is to say they're building div um, sections within their rows of variable widths, and they'll have like three sets of four in one and four sets of three in another, and there's really no sense, and something is offset, and suddenly it looks like a giant mess. So just because the grid makes it easy to make divs of all different sizes doesn't mean you should. You should probably have some sort of standard layout. For instance, you have a sidebar that's with column two and the rest of your content is 10 or three and nine, whatever works for you. Um, Pesticide.io is a browser plugin that is useful for looking at the box model and the grid on your site. Um, so on this page, it would look something like this. And when something is out of alignment, this makes it super obvious. Finally, color. Um, hue, contrast, blah, color theory, don't care. Um, value contrast, way better. Besides, many in, of people in our community are colorblind, and so value contrast is actually something you care about more. Um, black and white is OK. Um, a gentle monochrome is kind of the hip look right now. And so you can sort of see the difference. Uh, here, everything is in like a slight shade of green, um, from almost black to almost white and everything in between. 
and you would implement that in a preprocessor like LESS or SAS by using variables, you just pick your favorite color and use lighten and darken all over the place. And everything will look more or less like it goes together. That's what I got. Thank you. Thank you. All right, fun tidbit. I, myself, am actually a bit colorblind, so thank you for pointing that out. Um, all right, so next up is um, Clara talking about comments. What are they good for? Hello, um, I'm Clara. This is my Twitter handle. I'm going to talk to you about comments. Um, to start, um, if there are any beginner programmers in the room, everything that I'm going to say after this slide does not apply to you yet. Um, when you're a beginner, commenting everything is great. Uh, it's a good way to learn because you're still at that stage where you need to like, learn how to see your for loops and understand what that means. So if you want to write code like this where you have a comment after every line, I encourage you to do that when you're still figuring out how to grok code. Um, for everyone else, if you're writing a code comment, you should take a moment to stop and think about why. Because, co because comments go stale much faster than code. We can change the code and not change the comments and have it go out of sync, and it makes no difference to how our program runs. Um, and I notice in my experience that most comments try to either explain what the code is accomplishing, that is, you know, to what end are we affecting these steps. Sometimes it explains what the code is actually doing, what the steps mean. Um, and sometimes uh, there are comments that explain why the code isn't doing something that a reader of the code might reasonably expect it to do. Um, and a minor point of clarification, I'm talking about code comments like, you know, hashtag style, not the doc strings, because uh, the code comments are things that um, your, the audience are people who are reading your code, so other developers. A doc string is written so that other people don't have to read your code to use your stuff. So doc strings can also go stale easily, but because they have a different purpose, the people reading the doc strings don't necessarily read your code. It's a whole different set of constraints. Okay, so let's take an example um, of comments that explain what the code accomplishes. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen examples of code like this, um, probably a lot longer. It has like a long list of imperative statements. Um, and the author has realized that it actually gets a little confusing where you are, so they've nicely blocked them and put um, a comment at the top to tell you what's going on. Um, which is nice of the author, but wouldn't it be a not nicer if we just extracted those things into other functions or methods that have really nice, clear names. Um, so instead of seeing all the details of how I'm extracting the raw data about this particular puppy I might want to adopt, um, I, I just make a, make a function with that name. Um, and you know, in this case here where I say add shelter code, there's only one line. That's pretty self-explanatory. That comment was not necessary at all. Um, a bigger problem are, are comments that explain what code does, that is trying to explain what the steps are doing, because if this is a sign that your code is too obscure. If you have to explain to the reader of the code what this step is doing, um, it, you've made your code too hard to follow. Um, it's, a, it's a crutch to avoid refactoring, so you should consider just refactoring it already. Um, this is a very simple example, um, but it's an example of something that I've seen. Um, you see here, we've got a Boolean argument. It's not clear what it does, so someone has helpfully added a comment to tell you when, of course, this is exactly what keyword arguments are for. Um, this is a more complex version, also inspired by something I've actually worked with. Um, as I, I think we can all agree this is not a great structure. We have nested for loops. There's all these if statements. Um, and there's all of these comments to help you keep track of what's going on, because you have to load in so much context into your head to understand this. And like, why are we getting this header here? And you know, you have to put a comment on the break, because with three continues and a break in two nested for loops, it's hard to tell which loop you're actually affecting with that comment. Um, I'm not going to go into how to refactor this, but if you have code that looks like this, you, you should really refactor it. Those comments are, are just barely a crutch. Um, the last category I'm going to talk about is code that explains, or sorry, comments that explain why code isn't doing something. And this sort of comment, I think, can be okay. It's something that you may see, like, in a library that has to support um, a range of different versions of Python or different versions of other dependencies. Um, so in this case, for example, I have this nested try statement because I want to support Python 2.4 and I can't do the try except finally. Um, I, I probably could figure out a way to do this in code, but it would probably involve duplicating the functionality, and it's not a good idea. Um, so if you do have a comment that's, that's explaining this sort of thing, why, why we're not doing something that you expect, it might be OK. But consider whether you're covering up a hack that you, know, you did or are responsible for elsewhere, and whether refactoring that hack might be a better solution than adding this explanatory comment. 
Um, so in conclusion, instead of code comments, consider refactoring. Thank you, awesome. Um, lately my comments are pretty much just like, fix me and to do. <laughs> All right, next up, we have um, Alex talking about um, how dolphins and whales hear. Thank you. I just want to donate this to my lead advisor, Dave Mountain, who's shown in the picture right here. And uh, so just to get started, marine environment typically has low light, you know, at very deep depths. And uh, it's also a three-dimensional environment, which is relevant to this, because hearing is a three-dimensional sound or sense. In other words, I can hear where things are behind my head, you know, underneath me, as opposed to vision where it's just in the field of view. And uh, sound travels faster in water, in seawater, than it does in air. And one of the reasons that I do this research, I should probably say I study marine mammal hearing at BU, is uh, because uh, we're concerned that the uh, noise from the marine environment, you know, from things like shipping noises and naval exercises, is preventing whales from being able to communicate and hear and capture food, which are some of the things I have on this slide right here. And uh, so now I'm just going to get into a prototypical mammalian hearing system, which most of us have, is uh, the first thing in the system are the pinna, or the external ears. And uh, the function of those is to collect sound from the environment. And uh, they're asymmetrical, so they actually have some directionality associated to them. So something in front of me is going to sound different than something in back of me. Then the next stage is the middle ear, which has the eardrum and the little ossicles, the bones. And uh, those transfer the sound pressure to vibrations. And those vibrations then go on to the cochlea. And the cochlea is the, the cool part, I think. And uh, it transforms all the vibrations into neural signals. And uh, the neural signals leave the cochlea and go to the brain, I guess, for uh, this uh, clientele or audience right here. The cool thing is this uh, connection right here is, uh, I guess you'd say, massively parallel, asynchronous, bidirectional communication from the cochlea to the brain. And uh, so that's also uh, repeated on the right side. I guess if you could think of this in terms of objects and stuff, you know, this could be uh, an instance of a left ear and a right ear. And uh, so I'm just going to move on a little bit because I'm running out of time here. So uh, we could compare our anatomy, or terrestrial mammal anatomy, to, uh, to marine mammal anatomy. And the first thing that's obvious is whales and dolphins don't have a pinna. Like I have one here, the doggy has one, and, uh, or two, you could see there. But the, uh, the whale pinna is right here, and it's pretty much absent, which we uh, think is for a few reasons, one of them being drag. And uh, the other reason is that the, uh, in water, this one, the sound is hitting or coming in, if you can imagine a plane wave coming in. Like it, in uh, water, you don't have what we call an impedance mismatch, so the, all the acoustic energy comes through the surface of the skin into the animal's head, as opposed to in air, where uh, you know, we have the obvious ear hole in our ear, and the sound enters into the ear hole there. And uh, so this right here is a CT image of the hearing apparatus anatomy in a bottlenose dolphin. And uh, this is the beak of the animal. We're looking at the bottom of it here. And uh, so the interesting thing about these animals, you have these large fat bodies here, which we theorize might replace our external ears. And uh, so here yeah, I got some pointers right there. And uh, which the, uh, there are little external ears right here, but these fat bodies, have uh, similar acoustic properties to water and the speed of sound, and they terminate on the ear capsules, which are right here, and those hold the middle ear bones and then the cochlea, you know, which send the signals to the brain. And uh, let's see here. So moving into the ear right here, this is a, a CT reconstruction of a, uh, a harbor porpoise ear, and these white things right here are the middle ear bones. There's an eardrum connected to this, which uh, and is very close to that fat body. And so we theorize that the eardrum moves and then it's connected to these uh, middle ear bones by linkages, so the bones move. And uh, that causes the pressure in this thing right here called the cochlea to change. And as the pressure in there changes, there's a, a frequency selective response, which you call it, it's tonotopic, meaning that one part of the cochlea responds to high frequencies and then it there's a whole spectrum down to low frequencies at the other end. And uh, 
So then there's a neuron. Let's see, I have another picture here. This is the same type of image. Then the neurons come out of the, uh, the cochlea and go to the brain. And I have 20 seconds left, so I don't really have much more to say. Just want to thank you for, uh, for the talk. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> thank you so much. Anything with pictures of cute animals is pretty awesome. <laughs> All right. Next up, um, we have Nicola talking about C3 under control, um, scalable MROs for large hierarchies of classes. Bonjour. So I'm doing research in France in mathematics. So that's the kind of object that I love to play with. But that's not what I'm going to speak about today. Uh, the reason I'm here is that I'm, doing, I'm using a lot of computer to do experimentation. And I need to do a lot of calculations. And I need software for this. And am I going to use Maple, Mathematica? No way. I'm going to use Sage. And the reason is that there are a lot of nice features in Sage, one of them being that it's open source and it's in Python. But anyway, I'm not going to speak about Sage today, uh, because if, oh, and if you want to learn more about it, you should come to the Sage days next week during the coding sprints. I'm, what I'm going to speak about is a small technical issue, well, a technical issue we got when implementing Sage, and which we fixed. And maybe some of you had the same problem and would be interested by the fix. So in Sage, one of the main focus that we have in Sage is to try to model mathematics as closely as possible. And we do this by modeling each concept by a class. So this is a small piece of a class, of your, your class hierarchy. But the thing is that uh, the richness of mathematics comes from combining all those concepts in many different ways, which means that actually the hierarchy of class is a bit larger. But actually, it's a bit larger. So many people, in particular my fellow computer scientists, when they see this, they say, hey, you are crazy. It's impossible to maintain uh, a hierarchy of classes of this size. I'm not crazy. I'm a mathematician. <laughs> Is there any difference? OK. So it's actually relatively viable for two reasons. First, because it lies on strong mathematical foundations. We actually didn't made this hierarchy of classes. It actually exists in mathematics first. And the other thing is that we did build some infrastructure to make it possible to maintain. So there are things about mixins, and the thing I'm going to speak about is the C3 under control. So what is it about? It's about multiple inheritance. Because as you can see from the picture, we do use multiple inheritance rather heavily. So how does multiple inheritance work in Python? Uh, when you have a uh, hierarchy of classes like this, C inherits from A and B, and you look for a method, Python is first going to look in C, and then in A, and then in B. Uh, so this order, C, A, B, is called the method resolution order. And it of course, you want C to come first, but it also depends on which order you specify the sub what the subclasses are. So in this case, it would be D, B, A. So far, so good. And this is computed with an, by an algorithm which is called C3. Now, what happens if I do E, that inheres both from C and D? Then this is not consistent, because in one case, I want A to be B before B. And in the case, I want B to be before A. So what's going to happen? You get this dreaded error message. So who got this error message in this room? How many people? OK. Who got really annoyed by them? I did. I did, really. So the obvious thing is, OK, we just have to be careful not to have inconsistencies. So let's just choose a global order on the classes, and then be consistent locally. We tried this, and it failed. Each time we were adding a new classes, something wrong was going on. The reason for this is that even if all our local choices are consistent with the global choice, C3 may not follow the order we want to. So in this case, you use E, D, B, A, C, and not the converse. And so when it starts to be bigger, it gets painful. So we could say, OK, maybe it's enough to just take to find some order that would work. So that's what you tried. We tried, OK, I'm going to choose and set this convention in the developer's manual that all classes should be ordered this way. We tried, and it failed. We tried another order. It failed. We tried yet another order. It failed. And I was starting to pull my hair and think, hey, if I cannot fix this, imagine a new developer in Sage that wants to add its little class, and then everything bangs, and he has to fix the global order. It's just going to be a nightmare. Uh, so what to do? Uh, so that was the second thing. So when you start getting stressed out, you should just relax and do the math. Does there exist hierarchy of classes where it just doesn't exist a global order that works? We run a big calculation on the computer, and da-da, no. 
you won't be able to do this hierarchy of classes in Python. Annoying, isn't it? I started to pull my hair even more. Should we just fix Python? Should we just switch to some other language? What? Well, the luckily in those cases, what should you do? Relax. No, no math this time. But think outside of the box. The trick is that usually when E inherits from D and C, we just say D and C, but actually you can put everything in whatever order you want. And this works, and here I'm forcing C3 to follow my order that I want. This works, yay, but it doesn't scale. Luckily, you can have it be completely automatized, and that's what we implemented, and the, it works. The, neg the overhead is negligible, and the nice thing, it's completely automatic and transparent, so our new users don't even know that this is there. If you want to learn more about this, just get in touch with me, come to the sprints next week, or Google for C3 under control. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Next up, we have James Powell talking about um, symbolic literals. Hi, everyone. My name is James. Hi, James. Hi, James. I think we can do better than that. Hi, everyone. Hi, James. Very good. So those of you in the audience who recognize the call and response may know me from NYC Python. I help run NYC Python. We have the world's largest and most active Python meetup group. You can see we have almost 7,000 members, and we have a lot of events. So if any of you find yourself in New York, please stop by. We have events all the time. We want to see as many fresh faces as we can. One of the biggest events that NYC Python runs every year is PyGotham. We're going to be running PyGotham again this year around the same time in August. So watch out, we're going to have the CFP out very shortly. In addition to NYC Python and PyGotham, I also help organize the PyData conference series. We have events coming up in Berlin, London, Seattle, and Dallas. And in addition to that, I also help organize an open data science conference uh, on the 30th and 31st of M May in Boston. I am known on Twitter as don't use this code. I used to have a blog at seriously.dontusethiscode.com. My email address is james at don'tusethiscode.com. I think that should be a sufficient disclaimer for what I'm going to show you. If that's not sufficient, let me show you one thing that I'm known for, which is this is a pure Python module that embeds Python interpreters into themselves. So if you look at this, you can see I have 16 Python interpreters embedded into themselves all in the same process space. They can all share memory and look at each other. And it keeps embedding them until it actually runs out of space in the TLS block. Pretty wild. What I'm going to show you is something that I put together as a very simple uh, example for a talk that I gave just to show how easy it is to change the, Python, the C Python interpreter. I thought that this was something fun, and I didn't think it would be anything very useful. But a few people here have convinced me that this might be something that people might actually want to do. So I'll start with some very basic code. Let's say we have x and y, and we add them together. Nothing fancy. Well, let's say we want to represent the symbolic expression of x plus y. Well, we can do that with my little patch. So you can see now we're representing just x and y being added to each other. We combined x and y as values, and then actually perform the computation. If we want to do a slightly more complicated example like this, we could bind x. You can see that it replaces all the x's in the expression. We can bind it positionally, and we can bind it positionally and also bind y, and then evaluate that. So a couple of neat and kind of cute things fall out of this. Uh, one example is we could do something like this, or add sub intrusive. And then we could say this is an expression that represents a function being called with, one, with the arguments in one direction and the function being called with the arguments swapped. We can bind the actual values x and y and make another expression. Now, the only thing that's unbound is the function itself. So we can bind the function and call it. And we get different results. Now, you might wonder what's a possible use case for that. Well, I think one interesting use case, and the reason why some people have told me that they might like this, is in libraries like NumPy, NumExpression, Pandas, where we have to pass around strings to represent computations. This is a feature in the R programming language. You're able to represent these ASTs, these symbolic literals. In Python, you can't, so you have to pass around strings. So you could imagine at some point in the future, you might be able to do this. And then you could do something like this. and create some LLVM optimized version of that computation that makes use of all of your cores and is aware of the computation environment. So that said, I, thought, I hope you find that interesting. If you're interested in maybe trying to make this a real thing, come find me. 
Um, I'll be with Mike Mueller probably tomorrow and Monday at a sprint. He wanted a sprint on Mochi, so if you're interested in that, I'm in the front row. And then lastly, I just wanted to remind you, um, don't use this code on Twitter, and you can choose if you want to use it or not, but I thought it was something kind of cool. Thank you. Thank you. As I was telling uh, James, I think he was like the only one that like, can easily set up his Ubuntu machine for a presentation. <laughs> All right, so last talk for tonight, we have Joe um, talking about um, playing with Python bytecode. Hi, I'm Joe Jevnik, and I'd like to talk to you guys about playing with Byth Python bytecode and manipulating it to generate some new constructs. So first, uh, what is Python bytecode? Uh, when Python imports a module, first it compiles it into a lower-level stack-based language so that it can evaluate uh, your code more quickly. F uh, so this is a simple function. We've got add where we take a and b and we return the sum of them. So uh, what this needs to do is it's going to need to load the name a, it's going to need to load the name b, add these things together, and then return it. And when uh, you look at dis, which is the disassemble function, it takes bytecode and returns a symbolic form. Uh, you see that it does exactly that. So it loads uh, the name at index zero, which is A, loads B, adds them, and returns it. But what happens if you want to change this? So there's some, there are some tools that you can use to generate some cool Python. You have uh, common features like meta classes, descriptors, uh, exec and eval, common in the sense of in terms of this kind of stuff. Uh, then you have exotic things like AST, transformers, templating, and now bytecode transformations. So I was working on something where I wanted to do things that you cannot do without touching the bytecode. So this function uh, uses the not operator, which is implemented as its own opcode. You cannot override not. Unlike add, I can define a method, but I can't do that with not. So with my library code transformer, I can define a class that takes a function and returns and uses that function instead of not. So when I say not a, it actually says function of a, uh, which is something you can't do normally in Python. So I can take a new function uh, called my not function that looks up a method called not underscore. I can't use not because it's a keyword. Uh, if it doesn't exist, it just uses the default behavior, but if it does exist, it will call that function. And I will take the f function here transform it with my code transformer to get a new function entirely. So when I do that, uh, you can see that I have the disassembly of f. It's the same as before. I didn't change it. But I now have a new function called transformed f. And the bytecode for this function is load the name, then load a constant, which is like a, a literal that you would see in code. But here it's actually a function. We're then going to rotate them to put the uh, argument above the function and then we're going to call it and return that value. So if I define an object like C that, over, that uses this not method uh, to print hello world when I call not, then I can use my new f function. So when I call not in f, it actually is going to print hello world first and then return false. But because the false bool object does not override not, it just does the default behavior. So you're probably wondering, why do you want to do this? What's a, an actual use case for this? Uh, so I worked on a library called Lazy Python, where I have a lazy uh, execution model. And I needed to override things like is and not so that my deferred computation still had proper Python semantics. So here's an example of uh, an interpreter session where I have a lazy function, which is using the code transformer under the hood. It overrides a lot more of the operators, but, or of the bytecode, but uh, it does a very similar thing. Uh, it calls return print test. Uh, in normal Python, when I call this function, it's going to print test. But in lazy Python, it, la it waits until I strictly ask for the result. So there's all kinds of things you can do with the bytecode transformations, and you can do all kinds of non-actual Python syntax things with this. So if you're interested in using that, you can find it on GitHub. Uh, uh, for code transformer, they're on PyPy, and uh, yes, that is ten lowercase l's. So, thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much.
Uh, well, uh, that concludes uh, today's or tonight's lightning talks. If you like them so much, you can come back tomorrow at 830. Um, and now I expect you all to go to room 516 and spend all your monies at the Pilates auction. Thank you.